Hi everyone, we are now going to review a few of the problems at the end of chapter 12. Um, starting with problem 12-1. Just going to grab my classes so I could read it. <laughs> okay, where are they? Okay, so we have Bell and Green are forming a partnership. Bell invests 104000 and Green invests 156000 The partners agree that Bell will work one-fourth of the total time devoted to the partnership, and Green will work three-fourths. They have discussed the following alternative plans for sharing income and loss. It goes on to say, in the ratio of their initial capital investment, then in proportion to the time devoted, oh, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong one. Sorry about that. I never found my glasses, so <laughs> starting again. Problem 12-1B, how about this? Jen Novinsky and Jeff Quinlan form a partnership by combining assets of their separate businesses. The following balance sheet is from Novinsky's sole proprietorship. The market value of Novinsky's Novinska's equipment is 1000 and the market value of the land is 1600 Prepare the partnership's journal entry to record Novinska's investment. So remember, when a partner is contributing any asset or liability into a partnership, the partnership records that asset or liability at its fair market value. So cash is already at its fair market value, $200. Supplies, it doesn't say it has a different fair market value, so we debit supplies in the partnership. The equipment, although on Novinska's sole proprietorship has a book value of $400, we record the market value of 1,000. Same with the land. The book value of the land on their part on the uh, sole proprietorship's books is 800, but it's the market value that we use at the date that this land is contributed into the partnership to record it. Accounts payable would be credited for 100, notes payable credited for 1500. So they took essentially their sole proprietorship assets and liabilities and contributed them all into a partnership. And you can do that. So the total assets that were contributed were there's 32, 3,400. And the total liabilities the partnership receives, 1,600. So the difference is how much we record in Jay Novitsky's capital. $1,800. Okay, so one to run through a problem where you see what happens when a partner contributes assets into the partnership. And that's really a great example because it's assets and liabilities from their sole proprietorship. One way a partner can become a partner in a partnership. Going to the next page on page 4-6, Alvin Peters and Ramsey 12-3B this is. Albin, Peters, and Ramsey invested 164,000, 98,400, and 65,600 respectfully in a partnership. During its first year, the partnership earned $270,000. We need to prepare the journal entry to close the firm's income summary account, which holds the 270,000 of net income as of December 31st and allocate that 270,000 of net income under each separate and independent assumption. So if there is no partnership agreement, everything is distributed equally. We get there. So we would debit the income summary 270,000 and then just divide that by three. So each partner's capital balance would increase on the credit side $90,000. In two, the partners agreed to share income and loss on the ratio of their beginning capital investments. So now we would need to 
take, and there's the detailed computation, and add up the beginning balances of the capital accounts, 164,000 plus 98,400 plus 65,600. So the total capital is 328,000. We will now allocate the 270,000 based on the percentage each owner has of that total balance in their capital account. So 164,000 divided by 328 is 50%. So 50% 50 of the 270,000 would be allocated to Albin or a credit of 135,000 in their capital account. For Peters, we would take the $98,400 capital balance in their individual account divided by the total capital balance of 328 or 30%, 30% of the 270,000 or $81,000 of the profit would be allocated to Peters. And then finally, Ramsey. They have a $65,600 individual capital balance of the total capital of 328. So 20% of the 270,000 or 54,000 would be allocated to Ramsey. So just another way that we could allocate the profit or loss of the business. In the last scenario, the partners agreed to share income and loss by providing first for annual salary allowances, 96,000 for Albin, 72,000 to Peters, and 50,000 to Ramsey. So that's always going to be the first allocation, whether there's a profit or loss, because that's what each of them work. Now, the salary allowance is for allocating profit and loss. It is not them getting a paycheck from the partnership. Then they will allocate the next part at 10% interest on the partner's beginning capital investments and then share the remainder equally. So let's see how this works out for this partnership. So there's 270,000 to allocate. 96,000, the first 96,000 is to Albin, the next 72,000 is to Peters, and the next 50,000 is for Ramsey. That's their salary allowances. So 218,000 of the $270,000 profit has already been allocated. There's 52,000 left. The next thing in our allocation is to take the beginning balance of each capital's account times 10%. And that's what you see there. Albin's allocation here would be 10% of the 164,000 beginning balance he has, or 16,400. Peters, 10% of his beginning capital of 98,400 or 9840. And then finally, Ramsey, 10% of his capital balance of 65,600 or 6560. So if we add those three amounts up, the total amount that was allocated in this step is 32,800 which is great because it's less than the a balance that was left to allocate. So that means when we subtract that from the 52,000 that was still left after the first step, there's only 19,200 still to allocate and is positive. So we'll just divide that by three and each owner will share that equally. So now we add up the amounts for Albin in each step the 96,000, 16,400, and 6,400. So of the $270,000 in net income, Albin is credited 118,800. We'll do the same for Peters, 72,000 plus the 9840 from the second step plus the 6,400 from the third step. He will have allocated $88,240 and credit that to his capital account. And then Ramsey, will receive 50,000 from the salary allowance plus 6560 from the second step of the 10% of beginning capital balance. And then finally, the equal allocation of 6400. So his total amount of the net income is 62,960. So it could be as easy as step one where we just divide it equally, 
or a more complex calculation when we're just on step three. It all depends on what the partners in the partnership agree to do with profit and loss allocation. The final problem we're going to look at is Gibbs, um, I'm sorry, 12.5b. And this is dealing with the partner withdrawing and a partner being admitted. So let's see what happens. Gibbs, Hook, and Chan are partners and share income and loss in a 5 to 1 to 4 ratio. So the way when you're given a ratio like that, what you do is you add up the numbers. So 5 plus 1 plus 4. And that total will always be your denominator. And then create a fraction for each one. So in this case, five to one to four would be 10. So five tenths would be Gibbs. One tenth would be Hook. Four tenths would be Chan. Now they give us the percentages because those fractions would convert to those percentages. But that's when you're given a ratio and you have got to determine the percentage, that's how you do it. The partnership's capital balances are Gibbs 606, Hook 148, and Chan 446. Gibbs decides to withdraw from the partnership. Prepare journal entries to record Gibbs' April 30th withdrawal under each separate assumption. Gibbs sells her interest to Brady for $250,000 after Brady is approved as a partner. So now, you have to remember, you have to stop and say to yourself, did the partnership receive any new assets when this occurred? And the answer is no. The money exchange was to Gibbs directly. So all we do is debit Gibbs capital account to remove him as a partner and now add Brady with the same capital balance. So we just transfer Gibbs existing capital into Brady's capital account. Since the partnership did not receive any cash in this transaction, that's all we do. Gibbs instead gives her interest to a daughter-in-law, Cannon, and Cannon is approved as a partner. Again, so whether you the old partner sells their interest or gives it away, we'll debit Gibbs Capital account, the old partner, for the total balance and move their balance that's currently in the partnership into the new partner's name. Okay, what if instead Gibbs, the uh, partner who's leaving, is paid 606,000 in partnership cash for her capital balance? So she's owed 606,000, that's her capital balance, and she's paid 606,000 from the partnership. Now, when Gibbs leaves, there's no partner taking her place. So we'll debit her partner capital account and credit cash because the partnership is actually paying Gibbs the full balance of her capital. The next one. What if instead Gibbs is paid 350000 in partnership cash for her equity. Wow, that's significantly less than her capital balance. Now, there's no new partner taken over for her, okay? She is leaving. So we need to debit her entire capital balance for the full amount. Credit cash for 350. So she was entitled to 606, but only received 350. That's a $256 difference, $256,000 difference. And it could be Gibbs just wanted to get out of there and she didn't care. She was willing to take less cash. She just didn't want to be a partner in the partnership anymore. So essentially when that happens, there's $256,000 of capital that nobody received. Gibbs didn't get it. So who gets it? The other two partners. Now, what you have to be careful of here is Gibbs no longer is in the partnership. How do the remaining partners share in profit and loss? Remember, Hook is one, Chan is four. One plus four is five. So one-fifth 
of the $256,000 that Gibbs didn't take is credited to Hook and four-fifths, one plus four is five, four-fifths of the 256000 that wasn't given to Gibbs, that part of her capital is given to Chan, and she's okay with it. So that happens. A partner withdraws, and the old partners get a bonus. They get a bump up in their capital account. Chan can now take $204,800 of assets that before Gibbs left, he wasn't able to. Okay, so that's the ramifications here for that kind of withdrawal. Now, E, what if instead Gibbs has paid 200,000 in partnership cash plus some equipment that's on the partnership books at 538,000 less its accumulated depreciation of 336,000. So it has a book value of 202,000. Now what happens here? First of all, we debit Gibbs capital account. Now in a perfect world, she would receive assets of 606,000, but she's not. She's receiving cash of 200,000, okay? And then she's receiving equipment that has a book value of 202,000. Now, how do we remember? We have to remove that equipment because now the partnership doesn't own it anymore, Gibbs does. So we have to credit the equipment account for the original cost because that's what's in that account. And then we debit the accumulated depreciation related to the equipment because the partnership doesn't own that anymore. There should be no accumulated depreciation related to that equipment. So Gibbs receives really $402,000 of assets when she's entitled to 204. Okay. I'm sorry, 606, 606, sorry. So she's entitled to 606. She receives 200 and two. I'm doing it wrong, sorry. I gotta look at it one more time. She's entitled to 606,000. What does she receive? She receives equipment that has a book value of 202 and cash of 200. So she receives 402 of the 606 she's entitled to. So there's still 204,000 of capital that nobody received. Well now Hook and Chan, just like before, will allocate that 204 that Gibbs did not take to their capital accounts based on their current profit and loss ratio, one and four. So one fifths of the 204,000 or 20%, I'm just verifying it on my calculator, or 40,800 is credited to Hook's capital and then four fifths or 80% of the 204,000 left over is credited to Chan. So essentially Gibbs gave that part of her capital balance to the remaining partners. So it's just a different approach to um, withdraw a partner. Instead of just cash, what happens when they receive cash and some other asset? So those are some great examples and problems on what happens when a partner leaves a partnership. Take a look at the part two. Assume that Gibbs does not retire from the partnership described in part one. Instead, Chip is admitted to the partnership on April 30th with a 20% equity. So now we're looking at it from the other side. Now we're admitting a new partner. Now you have to remember something. We have to do some calculation here. When we're admitting a new partner, 
we want to first add up all the balances of the old partners. So we have Gibbs with 606, Hook at 148, and Chan at 446,000. So the total amount of old partner capital, and that just means before a new partner is admitted, is 1,200,000. So we want to keep that in mind for each of these scenarios. So our first scenario is CHIP, the new partner, gives the partnership 300,000. As soon as a partner gives an asset to the company, the equity increases. So now we want to determine what's the total amount of the new partnership capital balance. So add that 300,000 to the 1.2 million of old capital. Okay, now take 20% of that, 20% of the new capital balance amount, I'm sorry, the new capital amount is how much we should credit CHIP's capital balance for. So the amount he gave is also the amount we should credit his capital account for. Not because he gave cash of 300,000, but because after he gave the cash, 20% of the new partnership capital or 1.5 million is also 300,000. Keeping that type of calculation in mind, let's go to the next scenario. Remember the old capital balance between before a new partner is admitted is 1.2 million. In B, the assumption is CHIP gives $196,000. So now the new partner capital is at 1,396,000. So take 1,396,000, he gets 20% interest. Now, his capital balance is 279,200, less than the money he gave. He gives 196, he gets 279,200. So here we have a new partner with a lot more in capital, in his capital account, than he gave. This is called bonusing the new partner. Maybe the old partners are like, we really want this guy. He's really good. He's going to make us a lot of money. We don't care. He could give us less cash up front and have a higher capital balance. We'll reduce our capital balances for the difference. And that's what you see in the rest of the journal entry. The difference of 83200 be between what Chip gave and what his capital balance is, is allocated based on the remaining partner's profit and loss ratio. So 50% of that difference is allocated or debited to Gibbs Capital. So he essentially took it out of his capital account and gave it to Chip. Same with Hook. One-tenth of the $83,200 difference is debited to his capital account, as well as Chan, but 40% of his is debited to his capital account. So like I said, it's like they took they're, what they're doing there is taking the balance out of their capital, the respective amounts, and giving it to CHIP because CHIP did not contribute the same amount in assets. The final, CHIP instead gives 426,000. So now we got 1,200,000 is where the old capital balance is before CHIP gives us 426. We'll add the 426. The new capital is at 1,626,000. So multiply that by 20%. So although CHIP gives 426,000, his capital balance, 20% interest, is 325,200. So he gave more than he got. And maybe that's because now CHIP is the one going, I really want to be in this partnership. I'll give you 426,000 and only take a capital balance of 325,200. This is called bonusing the old partners. That difference is capital, but it is allocated and it's treated as if the old partners gave that money. So 50% of the difference will be credited to Gibbs, the old partner's capital account, hook 
10% of that difference or 10,080. So we increase the old partner's capital accounts for the difference. Since it's not in chips, it goes to them based on their profit and loss ratio. And then Chan, 40% of the $100,800 difference between what Chip gave and what he got is allocated to Chan. So that was a great problem to see, not only withdraw from a partnership, but the admissions, okay? So that concludes our review of the chapter 12 problems. Please make sure you post any kind of questions to the discussion board.